Well, good morning. So if you guys are you guys are stuck with me this morning, <laughs> which I think is going to be a good thing. Amen. Amen. Huh? A God thing. Amen. Father, I just I thank you for the opportunity to uh, be in this position, Lord. But Lord, it's not me; it's you. Lord, you've you've given me what I'm going to talk about this morning. And I just pray that you would take it and use it. And I just pray a blessing over everyone here. I pray a blessing over the hearers, over those that are going to hear it on a CD. Lord, that your word would go forth and it will not return void, Lord. You said your word will not return void. I just thank you for that, Father, in Jesus' name. So are you ready? Ready for what? Good question. That's a question that was posed to me two weeks ago, right before worship. Lee steps up into the booth, and he's got this ultra-serious look on his face, and he says, So are you ready? And my brain's saying, Ready for what? And I think a minute. Now, I didn't say that out loud, but I'm thinking, Ah, Pure Man Conference. I said, Pure Man. He goes, Well, yeah, that too, but that's not what I'm talking about. He says, Are you ready to fill the pulpit? Now, in my head and in my soul, I'm thinking, no, I'm not ready. I had, I had, you know, when he first asked me, I had no point of reference. I didn't know what he's talking about when he said he wanted me to fill the pulpit. I'm thinking to myself, I'm not ready. But my answer was, yeah, sure, I'll do it. Now, I felt nervous. I feel a little nervous right now. I felt inadequate. And I felt unprepared. How strange you should say that. Because they start about 15 minutes after they started, I'm asking the Lord. I said, Lord, I, I, was, I knew that sooner or later I would be asked. But I never anticipated it would be that soon. And so I hadn't given any thought what kind of message I would preach. Had no topic in mind. I said, Lord, what do you want me to talk about? I, I said, I don't think I can do this. And he goes... That's funny, you sound like Jeremiah. Come to think of it, you sound a little bit like Moses. <laughs> and you know, it was a good thing. When I, when I think about stuff like that, when I think about feeling inadequate and good prepared, it's actually a good thing because I don't want to rely on me. Amen. I want to rely on what God wants to do through me. Amen. Do we ever really feel like we're ready. You know, I was thinking about all the things in life, like the first day of school. Probably could have made those letters a little bigger. Um, it's, a, it can, it's a dramatic experience for a lot of kids, the first day of school. They're separated from their parents. They're going to this strange place with strange people. What about the last day of school? You're getting ready to step... <laughs> you're getting ready to step out into the world and you don't know what to expect. It's new. It's a new experience. It's like every new experience, your first job. It's the unknown. I think we all have a natural fear of what we don't know and what we can't see. We like a nice, comfortable path where we know what everything that's going to happen, especially certain of us who are a little more perfectionistic <laughs> than others. We don't like surprises. Marriage. You know, when I got married, I thought I was ready for marriage. I thought I knew what marriage was all about. I knew that verse in Ephesians that says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. I understood that word love was agape. It took me 15 years to realize I had no clue. It took me that many years to realize how selfish I was. When I started having children, that's another thing you think you're ready for. Children showed me how selfish I was. And I never realized till much later how selfish I had been towards my wife. And some of the things, the areas where I realized I was selfish, it broke my heart. How about losing a job? You know, this has been an interesting two weeks for me because he asked me on a Sunday, that Friday, and I knew it was coming. I knew that the company I was working for was running out of work. And I had had another company for about a year and a half that I had been wanting to make a transformation into. And that Friday I got laid off. 
but I'm a union electrician, and so I have to go down and sign the books. And when I signed, it was my number was 583. Now, I've got some really strange experience as an electrician. I've done fiber optic splicing. I've done security. I've done audiovisual um, control, lighting control. I've, and, and I told them about all these different things, and they came up as in this call. It was the strangest look I think I've ever, ever seen in my life. So naturally, I was the only one that went down to take the call. Now, when I knew I went down there, I knew it was going to make some people mad. So was I ready to go down and, and take this and face what I knew was coming? It was hard. It put a knot in my stomach. And I go out for my orientation, and this is something I didn't realize. They were setting me up as a foreman. They wanted me to run work at this hospital that they knew I'd done a lot of work in and had a lot of relationships built. Was I ready for that? I sure didn't feel ready. Um, meeting Jesus. And when I'm putting meeting Jesus here, I'm talking about physical death. Are we, are we ready to die? This is something that's very traumatic for a lot of people. They don't really, they're not sure if they're ready to die or not. Again, it's an unknown experience. They're unsure what's going to happen. There's one thing these all have in common, and that is that they're all things that we deal with in the physical realm. But let's talk about the spiritual realm. Are we ready for what happens in the spiritual realm? I was ready when I received Jesus. I don't know anybody that really wasn't. I think if you're not, you usually say no. But you know what? It's a scary thing. You don't, know, you don't know what to expect. It's a new experience. To seek his will for your life. Now, I don't know how many of you are in the same boat I am, but when I accepted Christ, my perception of Christianity was you get saved, you try to be a good person, and you live your life. And the thought of seeking his will for my life if it entered my life, or if it entered my mind, it wasn't high on my priority list. It was, you know, it was five or six years. And it wasn't until I came to a moment of despair and a readiness to just give up on everything that I finally asked God, okay, what do you want? And it was at that point that he began to put a calling in my life and show me some of the plans that he had for me. But then you've got to submit to that will. What if he says he wants you to go to Russia? That's a scary place. Not as scary now as it would have been 15 or 20 years ago. And there's probably scarier places. I mean, Mexico's pretty scary right now. You know, they, they're getting to where they don't like us very much down there. Letting go of the things of the flesh. You know, I had a lot of bad habits when I was a young Christian. I was... I smoke pot. I drank a lot. I tell a lot of people I spent my whole 20s in a drunken, drug-induced coma. And I wanted, there were many times towards the end, I wanted to give that up, and I felt very powerless. And you know, it's funny, in those things you... you, um, I struggle with sexual addiction, like most guys do. And it was, it was very disturbing for me to find out that I was getting... I was getting comfort from that. I was feeling protection from that. In my natural mind, it doesn't make sense. But in my heart, in my feelings, I know it was giving me something that was making me feel safe and protected. And those things are they're difficult to let go of because what are you stepping into? You're stepping out of something. Is it leaving a void or are you stepping into something else? What about stepping out and into the gifts of the Spirit? How many... People have experienced a moment where... Now, I think everybody goes through hearing from the Lord a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge and probably have never thought of it as that, but maybe thought of it as it was just intuition, not recognizing that it was from God. But what about prophecy? Have you ever been in a spiritual moment and something pops in your brain and you're like, where did that come from? But you don't step out on it? And you think, you know what, that was from God. 
The next time we get together, I'm going to step out on that. But you know what? That moment's gone. The Holy Spirit moves and keeps moving. But it's another thing. You, you're, you, there's a fear there that you want to be sure that what you're saying really is God and really is from God. What about stepping out to teach Sunday school? That's scary. And it's another thing where, am I good enough? Am I ready to do this? Can I do this? Do I, do I really have anything to teach them? Are we ready to give our testimony? And, you know, when you first think of testimony, we think about how um, we came to the point of salvation, where we were, what we did, what we thought, what we felt. But there's more to it than that. What about all the steps along the way where God has changed our life? All the things along the way that he set us free from. First Peter 3, um, 15 and 16, verses 15 and 16, But sanctify the Lord in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to everyone who asks you a reason of the hope that was in you, with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that while they speak against you as evildoers, they may be shamed, those falsely accusing you of good behavior in Christ. Why meekness and fear? Why does he say, be ready to give the reason of hope in you with meekness and fear? Because what happens when you share someone with Christ and they get, they get irritated at you and they start attacking you? The meekness in, in fear is to remember that why they're responding that way. That they're not responding to you. They're responding. They're confronted with judgment if they're responding to that. And that at one time, you were in that same place as they are. You know, there are times, I think, when we all feel like we're not ready. And it, and it is a feeling. And this is another thing in my Christian walk that recently, I would say recently, called the last year and a half, I've discovered that I had feelings. I never realized I had feelings because I spent a lot of time trying to deny that I had feelings. That's for women. Women have feelings. But uh, men have feelings too. And, and as I came more in touch and started to take ownership of mine, there have been times where I don't like my feelings because some of them don't feel the way I want them to. I like the happy ones, but I want to get rid of the, of the bad ones. But, uh, you know, God gave us feelings to help us in our decision-making. And, you know, it's, it's funny. I was thinking about how I didn't like my feelings, and I remembered that... The nation of Israel grieved the Holy Spirit. I mean, God grieved over the nation of Israel. God has feelings. He's full of feelings. He's full of very intense feelings. And if we're created in the image of God, it was ridiculous for me to think that I can get rid of my feelings and not have them. But just recognize what they're for. We, we, God doesn't want us to be ruled by our feelings but they're, they're necessary in helping us make decisions. Now, how do you define ready? We don't feel ready. But I was thinking about this. I thought, you know, maybe I better lay out what I call ready. Now, when he asked me if I was ready, I don't feel that I'm ready. But I know. But why did I say yes? Because I know that whether I feel ready or not, if I step out, God's going to equip me. And I was confident of that because I've been in that position before. So you may not want to step into the unknown, but with God, you know he's going to be there and he's going to help you through that. In our spirit, in our spirit, we are totally ready to serve God and to be who he's created to be. In our spirit, we're totally regenerated. We're totally perfect. And our spirit's ready to go. Our spirit's ready to be alive. So what hinders? I think it's our soul. Our soul's holding us back. Our soul has had years of being trained to look at things by what we see in the five senses, by what we see around us, by what other people say. Why? Fear. We have fear. We have fear in our soul that has to be overcome. And sometimes, the best way to overcome is just step out. Yeah. 
And in my thinking, as I was putting this together, so we are totally, why do we have so much fear? Because we're totally aware of how much we fall short. You know, we do a pretty good job of hiding how we fall short from each other. But we know that God sees us just as we are. And so to step out and to step up here and do something like this, it's like, Lord, am I good enough? Do I, do I, you know? But the good thing is, God sees us, and now I wish I wouldn't have put that in yellow. Hope you guys can see that okay. God sees us in the light of who he created us to be. In uh, 1 John chapter 3, starting in verse 16, we're going to go down through 22. By this we have known the love of God, because he laid down his life, suke, for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Now here's a word that stuck out to me, that never stuck out before, brothers. This is talking about other believers that are born again. I have a tendency, when I've read through this verse, I've had a tendency to point it towards the whole world. And we ought to have love towards the whole world. But it hit me strong when I looked at this next verse, verse 17. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother having need and shuts up his bowels from him, how does the love of God dwell in him? That word bowels is like an intestine is what it's talking about. It's talking about, you ever have a time when you're doing something and you just have a knot in your stomach and that knot in your stomach is telling you that what you're doing is not what God would have you do. He would have you do something else. Well, it's possible to shut up that and shut that off to where you're not sensitive to that. You're not sensitive to what God wants. And again, he's talking about brother. You know, we, I've had, when I've looked at this verse, the first thing it says to me is I'm supposed to give to the whole world. And it takes a picture of just giving up everything I have. And that's not exactly what God's asking us to do. But what he is telling us to do is if we see a brother and he's in need and we have the thing that can help him out, we have a responsibility as part of the body to reach out and do something about that. Verses 18 through 21, My children, let us not love in word and tongue, but in deed and truth. And in this we shall know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him that if our heart accuses us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not accuse us, we have confidence towards God. So how do we come over, overcome that fear? It's by being sensitive to him. Let me read down a little further. Verse 22, and whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments, commandments and do those things which are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of Jesus and love one another as he gave us commandments. And he who keeps his commandment dwells in him and he in him. And by this we know he abides in us by the spirit which he gave us. The more we're connected with God and we're hearing his voice guiding us into what to do and where to reach out and how to love and how we can love and how we can be in touch, then we have that confidence towards God. Our heart isn't condemning us. But when we've known that the Lord wants us to do something and we don't do it, we feel convicted about that. And that word, um, accuse, it's a... It's accused. It's not condemn. I think the King James says condemn. That's not a. That's not a, an accurate translation. It's it's more of a pointing towards. You know what's wrong. Accusing, um, convicting. I think is the word that's often used. I thank my God upon remembrance. Philippians, chapter one. Verses two through six. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in my prayer of mine, making request for you with all joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will perform it until the, until the day of Jesus. This Christian growth, it's a, it's, a, it's a continual thing. It's not, we're not stepping into it by osmosis. 
But he, we have a promise that he's going to continue, that he, he is faithful, and he is going to continue to do that good work in us. And, and that's how we can be confident that when he puts something in our heart to do, he's going to provide the way to do that. He's going to put the, the thoughts, the words in our heart. He's going to sh- reveal to us how this is all going to be accomplished. But who's doing the work? God is. It's God's work. All we are is the vessel and the tool. Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. And it happened, the word of Jehovah came to me, saying, I have formed you in the belly before I knew you. I think I left out a word there. Before... And before you came forth out of the womb, I consecrated you and I ordained you a prophet for the nations. Before he was even born, God had a vision and a plan for what he was going to want to do with Jeremiah. You know what? He has the same thing for each one of us. Before each one of us were ever born, he knows what he sees. Now, our decisions affect what happens with that, where we actually follow and ordained him as a prophet. Jeremiah didn't decide, you know what, I think I want to be a prophet. And he just goes out and starts prophesying things. This was something God ordained. This was something God planted inside of him. This was his identity in God. It existed before he physically existed. This is a God thing. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 6. Then I said, At last, Lord Jehovah, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am a boy. He's feeling inadequate. Why? Because of his age. And because in his culture and the people around him, everybody had to go through a certain amount of training. They had to sit under a rabbi. They had to do, there was a tradition set up by men that they had to do all these other things before they would be prepared to do this. I'm not old enough. I haven't been trained. Says who? Men. According to the traditions of men and man's way of looking at life and purpose. Man deciding out of his own intellect and out of what he sees in the natural and what he's seen work, what the order of things should be. But Jehovah said to me, Do not say I am a boy, for you shall go to all that I shall send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. See, it's God doing the guiding. It's God's words. We're just the vessel. What we need to do is get out of our intellect and man's ways of looking at things and speak what God says is truth. This was my first PowerPoint. Do you like the little bouncy lines there? Um, stop seeing yourself in your eyes and begin to seek how God sees you. Let's begin to try to... It's, it's a hard thing to do. I've asked him to show me how he sees me. And it's a hard thing because we have so many pre- preconceived ideas of who we are. And most of us probably have some judgments and stuff. that it's hard to be open to what God's saying. Um, Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says Jehovah. And Jehovah put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And Jehovah said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. Behold, I have this day set you over the nations, over the kingdoms, to root out, pull down, and destroy. Now this, this one blew my mind. He he spoke to Jeremiah what was to come as if it already existed. I mean, he didn't step away from God this moment. And suddenly he's this awesome thing that's put all these nations to shame. But that's who he is. God's speaking to who Jeremiah is. He's telling him who he is and what he is and what he's created him to be. And then I thought about Moses. This this poor guy here. He I never realized what a rough time he had until I started studying through this. Exodus three verses 1 through 4 
Moses kept the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian, and led the flock to the back side of the desert. And he came to the mountain of God, to Horeb, and the angel of Jehovah appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of, thorn, of a thorn bush. And he looked, and behold, the thorn bush burned with fire, and the thorn bush, uh, thorn bush was not burned up. And Moses said, I will now turn aside to see this great sight, why the thorn bush is not burned up. And, Joseph, and Jehovah saw that he turned aside to see. I thought that was funny. And God called to him out of the midst of the thorn bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. You notice God is there. He's making himself known. He's making his presence known. But he waits for Moses to acknowledge that he exists. God's making his presence known to us. But he's waiting for us to acknowledge that he exists. Because once we acknowledge he exists, he begins to get an indication that maybe we're ready to listen to him. Exodus chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. And he said, Do not come near here. Pull off your sandals from your feet, for the place in which you stand is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Verses 7 through 10, And Jehovah said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard the cry because of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows, and I am come down to deliver them to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land to a good land, a large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. And now go, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring forth my people, sons of Israel, out of Egypt." Now, who's going to do the work? God said, I will come down and deliver them. But then, look, he tells Moses, now go. He's telling Moses to go, but he's saying, I'm going to deliver them. So who's doing the work? He is, but he's going to do it through us. He's coming down to move through us to do his will. He commands us to go, and then he waits to see if we're going to be obedient. God doesn't move until we do. If we move, God moves with us. As we move in obedience, he comes alongside with the power to accomplish what he has planned. Exodus 3, verses 11 and 12, And Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the sons of Israel out of Egypt? Is Moses getting it yet? No. His focus, at this point, is on his own ability. And he said, I will be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God upon this mountain. Exodus 3, verses 13 and 14, And Moses said to God, Behold, when I come to the sons of Israel... And shall say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? So he's past Pharaoh. He's going, Okay, you're going to deal with me with Pharaoh. What about the children of Israel? Now he's starting to think and be concerned about what they're going to say. Moses really had a hard time trusting God, which is kind of interesting. He sees the bush, he sees that it's flaming and that it's not being burned up, and then he hears it speak to him. He knows this is something he's never seen before. This is a power that he doesn't understand. He definitely doubts his own ability, but he is letting fear guide his thoughts. I mean, he just ran away from the people in Egypt because he knew the Egyptians wanted to kill him. 
And even his own people didn't understand that God was raising up someone to deliver them. They certainly spent, didn't, did not look to man. They looked for a higher intervention than for God working through a man. And God said to Moses, I am that I am. And he said, you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Now Exodus 3, verses 15 through 19, And God said to Moses again, You shall say to the sons of Israel, Jehovah, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. And this is my name forever. And this is my title from generation to generation. Go and gather the elders of Israel and say to them, Jehovah, the God of your fathers, has appeared to me, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I have surely visited you, and out of the affliction of Egypt, to the land of the Canaanites, and to the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, to the land flowing with milk and honey, and they shall listen to your voice, and you shall come, you and the elders of Israel, to the king of Egypt, and you shall say to him, Jehovah, the God of the Hebrew, has met with us. And now let us go, we beseech you, three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to Jehovah our God. And I am sure that the king of Egypt will let you go. No, not by a mighty hand. God doesn't expect us to come up with the plan. He's ready to open our eyes to what he's doing and to show us. We may not lay the whole thing out all at one time, but one thing at a time. And as we step out and we do that one thing, he shows us the next thing. But he has the plan. And he will lay it out for us if we become sensitive to his voice and listen to him. And then once we've heard and understand, obey. And I will stretch out my hands, verses 20 through 22, I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst of it, And after that, he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And it shall be that when you go, you shall not go empty, but every woman shall ask of her neighbor and of her that stays in her house, jewels of silver and jewels of gold and clothing, and you shall put them upon your sons and upon your daughters, and you you shall plunder the Egyptians. You know, at the end of God's plan, there's a great reward. I mean, for us, it's, it's more than salvation. There's rewards along the way for obeying God, blessing. And, but we have to be willing to obey to receive it. And some of the reward is, is immediate and obvious, and some of it isn't. You know, he promised to lead them into the land of milk and honey. And if they go through and obey right here immediately, they're going to have, they get the gold and the silver and all these other material things that are taken care of. But they have to have faith and hope to, go, to keep moving and move into the land of milk and honey. There's so much that God wants us to give us, but it starts with the small steps, and some of the record, reward requires time and patience to see it. I think sometimes God's blessed me and I wasn't even aware that it was God's hand and it was God's blessing until down the road. Exodus 4, verses starting in verse 1, And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me nor listen to my voice, for they will say, Jehovah's not appeared to you. <laughs> It's like no matter what he tells God, no matter what God tells him, he's just having a hard time believing it because he knows how men think. And Jehovah said to him, What is this in your hand? And he said, It's a staff. And he said, Throw it on the ground. And he threw it on the ground, and it became a serpent, and Moses ran from it. And I never saw that one before. I never knew he ran from the stick. I thought that was funny. You know, they seek a sign, and then when they see a sign, they're afraid of it. Isn't that how we are? We seek a sign, 
And we're not afraid, and we're afraid of it. And it was something God told him to do. Did he not believe that God was going to protect him from that? But you, you respond. Like I said, in your soul, you're trained. You see a snake, you run. That's dangerous. And God said to Moses, put your hand and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand and caught it, and it became a staff again. So that they may believe that Jehovah, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. And Jehovah said to him again, now put your hand on your bosom. And he put his hand on his bosom, so when he took it out, behold, his hand was as leprous as the snow. And he said, put your hand into your bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again. And he brought it out of his bosom, and behold, it turned again like this other flesh. In other words, it was healed. His leprous was all cleared up. And it will be that if they will not believe you, neither listen to the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the later sign. And also it will be that if they will not believe these two signs, neither listen to your voice. Then you shall take one of the, of the waters of the river and pour it on the dry land, and the water which you take out of the river shall become blood on the dry land. Exodus verses 4, 10 through 12. And Moses said to Jehovah, O my Lord, I am not a man of words, nor since you, <laughs> nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Now here's something I thought of that had not dawned on me in all the times of reading about Moses, is that he was raised by Egyptian royalty. This man was highly educated. Now how can he stand here and say that he's slow of speech and slow of tongue? Is he just shy? I, I, I can't help but think that he's back to his sense of how inadequate he is and how, how much he doesn't measure up to who God is. And, oh God, I know you can overcome these, but how am I going to, by my words, convince anybody of anything? Verse 11, And Jehovah said to him, Who has made man's mouth? I read this word, I'm thinking, you know, he's starting to get irritated. <laughs> or who makes the dumb, or the deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I, Jehovah? He's reminding him who, who created everything, who put everything into existence, and who can do and change anything that he wants to. God can, I can, Jehovah can. And now go, and I will put with your mouth, I will be with your mouth, and teach you what you shall say. Again, it's not our words. It's not our intellect. We don't have to rely on how smart we are or how wise we are. God does all the work. He just needs us to be available. He just needs us to be willing to step out. It's His plan. It's His work. We're simply the tools that He's using. And he will not just possess us and force us to go through motions like we're, yeah, robots. And he said, oh, my Lord, I pray you, by the hand of him whom you will send. No, I pray you, send by the hand of him who you will send. Now, I had trouble understanding this. But what he's asking is for, you're sending me, but send somebody in, ahead of me to do what you want me to do. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Do I not know Aaron the Levite, your brother, that he can speak well? And also, behold, he comes forth to meet you, and when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. Now, I just, how can he hear God tell him all that he's going to do, and that he's going to give him the words, and that he's going to be the power that goes before him, and be so timid. He seems very timid and very unconfident to me. But you know what? I think, I, I don't think he's so indifferent than we are. Right. Now, why did God become angry? God's looking for men of faith. God's looking for people that are going to believe what he says when they say it to him. For with faith, it's, it's impossible to please God. Amen? 
He's looking for us to have faith. Moses is still controlled by his fear. I don't want to sound like I'm picking on Moses because you know what? Sometimes I'm still controlled by my fear. Exodus chapter 4, starting verse 15. And you shall speak to him, and, he sh- and, and you shall put the words in his mouth. And I will be with your mouth and with his mouth and will teach you what you shall say. And it will be that he shall speak for you to the people and he shall be for a mouth to you and you shall be to him a God. Now this kind of bugged me a little bit. You shall be to him a God. What is that, what is that game? I want to try something this morning. I don't know how this is going to work. But that game to where you whisper something in someone's ear and they whisper it in someone's ear. Telephone, the telephone game. Can we try that? Can I have like maybe six people volunteer? You want to volunteer? Huh? Yeah, the youngins. Yeah, we need some we need some old people that can't hear very well too. Do we have any of those? <laughs> Uh, that could be too. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Sure. 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 Now, this was something I saw in a movie, and when this is all over, you may recognize the movie. I thought it was the most hilarious scene in the movie. <laughs> What? Okay, now what do you think he said? What do you think I said? Tony is going to kill John at the Savoy Theater. Tommy is going to kill Johnny at the Savoy Theater tonight. Pass it on. But, but now my point, you see what my point of that is? God doesn't want a chain of people he has to go through. He wants to talk to me to speak. Because the more it goes through a system, the more it has a tendency to break down and not be what God started with. Huh? I said, Tommy wants Johnny, Tommy's going to kill Johnny at the Savoy Theater tonight. It's a line from a movie with Michael Keaton. At the very end of it, it's all messed up by the time it gets to him, but he goes, Tommy's going to kill Johnny at the Savoy Theater tonight. He goes, that's not what I said. Yeah, but I know this chain gang. (laughs) I just, it was, it was a silly movie. But <laughs> what movie was it? Um, Johnny Dangerously. Anyway, that's my bit of levity. The Lord, the Lord and the, the other thing was, the Lord doesn't want us to be gods to other men. The God, He doesn't want us putting each other on pedestals. He, you know what? He's anointed. Every one of you, as much as he's anointed Lee, Amen. or is right. Right. Lee's been a long ways down the road. He's got a lot of experience. He's got a lot of maturity. But every one of you has the same anointing he does. That's right. That's right. And you shall take this rod in your hand, with which you shall do signs. God goes to great lengths in accomplishing His will. You know He wanted Moses to be the one that would just step out and do everything. And Moses did. Moses went forth, but he didn't follow exactly what God's plan. But that's okay. God will work with whatever we're willing to do. Can you go back to the 16th? So what did, when God said, and you shall be to him in God, what was he really saying? The next statement of the Lord does not want us to be God's other men. It's a spiritual authority, but doesn't it seem like it's a spiritual authority that God didn't really intend? Was, was, did Moses not get put in a place to where, and especially if you read on further, to where I've, I have been convinced that God wanted the nation of Israel to come to him. But the nation of Israel was afraid of him. And so they told Moses, they put Moses in this position of 
well, you go up and find out what he says. I mean, they saw the fire on the mountain. They got all freaked out. And they go, you go up there and find out what he says. And you come tell us and we'll do that. Of course, they didn't do it. But they put Moses in a position of being their God. God wanted to be their God. God wanted to be their judge. You know what I mean? He wanted to be their king. It wasn't very long before they were tired of having God as a king. And they set up kings for themselves out of men, like other kings. But, you know, that puzzled me. I never noticed that that word was there before until I was reading through it this time. And you shall be to him as a god, a little g-god. A little clear? Does it? But I think what's happening, since God is going to give Moses the word, and then Moses is going to give Aaron the word, Moses is being the conduit for Aaron, so he's acting as God's conduit. Right. You know, uh, we look at the foundation, Christ is the cornerstone, and then the apostles and prophets. The world thinks of great people as being on top, but mm -hmm. the kingdom of God is upside down, so Christ says the foundation and the cornerstone is an entirely different concept. Moses was meek, and we know from previous teaching that that is incredibly submitted to God and empowered by God's authority, and so maybe that might help us. Right. Right. But don't you think that it would have been that God would have liked to have been able to speak to Aaron? And I think God would have liked, well, I know he would, or he would have got angry at him, that he would have liked Moses to step out on his own. God wants to speak to each of us. But in his timing, because that's why he brought Jesus, the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Are you born again of the Spirit of God? I think everyone in here is born again of the Spirit of God. If so, then God has a great vision for your life. He has a plan for your life. We just need to seek it and find out what it is. If not, then God has a great vision for your life. <laughs> you know, God so loved the world. It doesn't say God so loved the Christian. God loves everybody, and God has... Had a, had a plan from the point of conception with everyone, but the decisions that we make and whether we're going to receive that will affect what the outcome is. Being ready does not mean that you're the oldest, the smartest, the best trained, or even the most talented. It simply means that you're willing to be used. Amen. Amen. So, anyway, so, Lord, I, I, just, I thank you. I thank you that you, I thank you for your love, that you love us so much, that you reach out so far to take us up, and that you're so faithful, and that your love is personal, and that you've overcome the bondage of religion. You've made it possible for us to overcome the bondage to religion and you've, your desire is for relationship and that you want to speak to each one of us, Lord. And now I just pray that you would just open our ears, the ears of everyone here more than they have been before and just speak to us more, Lord. Show us what you're doing. Show us what you have that placed ahead of us to do. And Lord, we just commend ourselves into your hands, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.